haven't done this before, so I was trying to figure it out earlier. <laughs> okay, looks like we're live. All right, uh, my name is Annie. I work with the Alaska Office of Boating Safety. I'm the education coordinator here. Um, so today I was just gonna tell you guys a little bit about um, our program and what kind of education programs we offer. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about cold water and life jackets and things that you can do um, to be ready for the upcoming uh, holiday weekend. So um, to start off um, with the Alaska Office of Boating Safety, uh, we offer lots of different types of education programs. So we offer programs for adults. We can do presentations like this one, uh, where we talk about um, just safe boating practices, some of the technology that's out there, um, and some resources for boaters. And then we also offer classes for kids. So we offer classroom classes. Um, we work with summer camps or culture camps. Um, and we also offer um, paddle classes. So we'll, um, we can bring out stand-up paddle boards. We have some that inflate, so we'll travel to do that. Now that COVID's kind of, um, you know, coming back a little bit, um, those restrictions are coming back, we're able to start traveling and to do that again. Um, so that's exciting. We also offer in-water classes as well. Um, so we've worked with the um, fitness center in Bethel before um, and worked with the, the kids at the schools there. Um, but we also can work uh, if, you know, schools are coming into Bethel for, you know, sports events or um, anything like that. We can um, meet you out there and do sort of a, a planned boating safety um, as an extra activity. So we're pretty flexible that way. Um, and so we have lots of programs we can offer. We also have, um, if you follow our Facebook page, Alaska Boating Safety Program, that's a really great way to learn about our uh, classes that we have coming up or the types of classes that we can offer in different areas. Um, so I wanna start off uh, talking about cold water um, and some of the, the physiological effects of that because I think it's very important to understand. Um, as we're, we're going in. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here, see if this will work. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. Um, that's okay. Um, so for cold water, some of the things that um, it's important to understand, um, when we look at our, our boating fatalities that we see, um, just on average year to year, they, they tend to look a lot alike. Um, most of our boating fatalities are adult males, most of them not wearing a life jacket. And so understanding that kind of helps us to, to understand why knowing about cold water and life jackets are so important. Uh, nine out of 10 of those boating fatalities also happen in boats that are less than 26 feet. So those are small open boats, the type of boats that we use most of the time on the river. Um, half of them happen in fresh water, half of them happen in salt water. So um, they're happening kind of all over. And then um, five out of six of them are the result of a capsizing, swamping, ejection, or fall overboard. And that's also important to understand because these are what we consider to be sudden onset emergencies. They happen really fast. So if you don't have on a life jacket, it's going to be very difficult for you to put one on um, before you need it. You're not going to have time to do that with the types of accents that we see commonly in Alaska. Some causes of that, some of it are within our operator control, some of them are not. Um, a lot of it comes down to how are we loading our boat? Um, is it balanced? Is it overloaded? Are people moving around? Is our load shifting? Those are all things that are within our control. All right, I'm going to try to share this screen again and see what happens. All right, and then Tiara, you can just kind of give me a, a, a thumbs up if uh, you can see that okay. Yep, it looks good. All right, great. Um, so these are some of the things um, that we can um, uh, control, some of the things that we can't control, some of those causes um, of the emergencies that we're seeing. 
Weather and seas, sometimes that's outside of our control. Things happen quickly in Alaska, weather changes quickly. And so we may go out well within our control, um, but then as we're going, um, you know, the weather may change, the sea state may change, or the water state may change, uh, the wind may change. All of those things can contribute to, um, you know, boat accidents happening. And our boat handling, that is within our control. Um, are we operating um, safely, especially for the load that we have, for the conditions that we're in, for um, the, the type of water that we're on? Um, you know, are we operating sober? Those are all things that are within our control. And passenger behavior, that is within our control for the most part. Um, you can set the standard for your boat, tell your people, um, your passengers, how you want them to behave. So for example, um, if you know that passengers moving around in the boat um, are going to affect the way that that boat handles, um, you know, make sure that before you go out, you make it clear that you don't want people moving around while you're underway. Um, also, you know, loss of balance. Sometimes that, um, you know, it is or it isn't within our control. Again, things happen quickly, but um, a lot of the things that we do while we're out on boats, like fishing and hunting, um, when we can, if we can, you know, shoot from a seated position, if we can cast from a seated position or pull nets from a seated position, those are, um, you know, that's just going to make it safer. It's going to make it less likely for us to lose our balance. Um, and then again, hitting objects. A lot of times, you know, that may or may not be in our control, especially when you're boating. Um, specifically on rivers, um, things move through the water all the time. There can be submerged logs that weren't there before. Um, even the bottom of the river can shift and change. And so um, it's just important to be aware of that as, as you're traveling through. So this is again, just a little bit about our, our program. Um, we have these uh, life jacket learner boards, which are free. Um, we ask for a sponsor in the area so anyone can start a learner board. So if you feel like there should be a spot where there's life jackets, where there's not currently, um, you can get in touch with us. Um, again, Alaska Boating Safety Program on Facebook or Office of Boating Safety at alaska.gov. Um, we can get you those uh, life jackets out there. And our education program, um, is sort of separate from the Life Jacket Learner Board program. Um, again, this is to date, we know there have been um, 36 people who have gone into the water without a life jacket uh, or with a life jacket who wouldn't have had one had they not borrowed one off of a Kids Don't Float Learner Board. So it's exciting, it's a great program, we know it works. Um, I feel pretty confident saying that there are probably more people out there um, who have had situations like that um, and we just don't know about them. So it's a great program. Um, we're excited to be able to be a part of it. This is one of the more recent saves. Um, you can see uh, this little guy is a little cold and wet, but his parents are pretty happy uh, to still have him uh, around thanks to that life jacket he borrowed off the winter board. We offer those school programs I was talking about. Uh, we call it a school program, but it's really, you know, any organized group of kids. It can be summer camps, culture camps. Um, you know, after school programs, uh, leadership programs, lots of any any place where you've got a group of kids will come out and do a class. Um, and we talk about a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, cold water, uh, that life jacket law, who has to have on a life jacket, how do you um, make sure that you're complying with that, and then how do you pick out a good life jacket for you? We have this ambassador program, which is um, a really great program. What you see here is uh, these high school students learned about the Kids Don't Float program, cold water, life jackets, and they're now teaching it to the younger kids in the community. So what these little guys are doing is sticking their hands in cold water and understanding how that cold water affects their hands and the way that they work. So um, it's a really great program. You have these little kids who look up to these older kids in the community who are um, learning from them. And then these older kids are learning leadership skills. And hopefully they're also more likely to wear their life jacket um, if they're talking about how important they are. This is that pool program I was talking about. Um, it's a really great program. Uh, you've got kids. Um, learning how to get back into the canoe. I shouldn't say it's just for kids, it's also for adults as well. Um, 
people learning how to get back into a canoe, how to reboard, um, how to keep it balanced, what happens if you overload your canoe. Um, we bring out clothes that you would be wearing, so like Carhartts and hoodies and um, jackets, and um, we have you try to put on a life jacket in the water wearing all those clothes that you would normally wear, because if you choose not to wear your life jacket in the boat, that could be the situation that you're in. So it's usually a pretty good eye opener and why it's so important to have life jackets on in the first place. We bring lots of different kinds of life jackets so you can try them in the water and actually see how they work. Um, and then we also do man overboard. So what happens if someone falls out of the boat? How do you get them safely back to the boat or to shore? So we practice those things in the water and it's really valuable um, and people tend to get a lot out of it. And then this is that on water we were talking about. We do paddle programs um, and then uh, where we do a lot of that same stuff. So how do you flip a boat back over? How do you get people back into it? Um, and then we also do um, for agencies, we can't do it for the general public, but we do some boat operation training as well. And then again, we do presentations like this um, where we just kind of cover specific things. Um, and then uh, we also offer presentations, um, classes that are, it's eight hours. It covers very in-depth navigation, uh, trip planning, preparation, um, everything that you would need to know going out onto a boat. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a few minutes, kind of jump through, get to where we're gonna pick back up with cold water immersion. There we go there. Perfect, so we're gonna start off talking about uh, cold water immersion. So it's important to understand um, that there are lots of risk factors that go into how does this cold water affect us specifically. Um, one of those things is the speed of immersion. So did you tiptoe in like the kid in this picture kind of weighed in slowly? that's gonna affect how some of these stages of cold water immersion influence your body. Um, did you jump in, but expecting to jump in? Did you uh, fall in and not expect to go in? All of those things are gonna affect the way that your body responds to suddenly being in this cold water. The water conditions will affect that. So if you're in a nice calm lake, uh, like this kid here, um, you know, it may not affect you in quite the same way as if you're out um, where it's really choppy and waves are kind of breaking over your head. That's going to um, cool you down faster because your head's not going to be able to stay out above that water, especially if you don't have on a life jacket. Habituation is huge. Um, I, uh, I worked at a summer camp. Uh, my first summer up here, I grew up on the East Coast, um, Northeast. And so we did swim outside, um, but there was kind of a season where you did that, where the water was warm. And so you would swim outside when the water was warm. Um, and then it didn't take me long after moving to Alaska to realize that the water just never really gets warm. So I guess I just assumed that people didn't swim outside. But I was working at the summer camp on Kenai Lake, which is a glacial fed lake. It's very cold. Um, and it was Memorial, it was right for Memorial Day. So right after breakup, um, there were still big chunks of ice in the lake. Um, in the first week, I had six and seven year old little girls um, in my, my cabin. Um, and they, I noticed on our schedule that we had a swim time and I was like, that's just crazy. There's no way they actually mean that we're going swimming, but that is exactly what they meant. These tiny little girls, they put on their swimsuits. We went down to the lake and they would run in um, and splash around for a few minutes, come out, run around in the sun, go back in for a few minutes. And we did this for an hour. Um, and so those kids, um, and I'm sure in a lot of places on the Kuskokwim River, uh, kids do the same thing. And so um, people who are used to going in and out of cold water like that, these your body's going to react differently than someone who is from a warm weather environment, um, not used to being in cold water, their body's not going to adjust through those first few stages as well as someone um, who's more habituated to that. Clothing also plays an important role. Um, so the more clothing you have on, the more insulated it's gonna be. Um, 
there's sort of this myth that those clothes will drag you down, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, you'll maintain neutral buoyancy when you go to try to pull someone in who has on a lot of layers, then yes, you're going to notice that they're a lot heavier. But while that person's in the water, their clothes aren't going to drag them down. It is going to make it harder to swim, though. So it's sort of situational. Um, you can, if you're close to shore and you're just trying to swim and your clothes are making it difficult to do that or your boots are making it difficult to do that, then maybe you want to kick them off. But you do also want to think that once you get to shore, how far away are you um, from help or how far away are you from the closest community? You might want those boots um, if you're going to be walking for a little while. So you might not want to get rid of them. Those are all just sort of some things that you want to take into consideration because that clothing, even when wet, is going to help insulate you um, and keep you a little bit warmer than if you um, didn't have all of those layers on. Your recent food intake, so if you had a really big breakfast with a lot of calories, um, that's all going to help keep you warmer longer if you have energy to burn. Um, and then people with certain health issues um, like asthma or um, cardiac issues, you are going to be at a higher risk than people who do not have those, those health problems. So these are the three stages of cold water immersion that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the cold shock response, cold incapacitation, and immersion hypothermia. So the cold shock response is the first thing that happens when you first fall into cold water. Most people have experienced this at some point, um, whether you have fallen into cold water, um, uh, you know, even if you were, you know, taking a shower and the hot water cut out, you've experienced this gas reflex. Um, and it's not just one gas, but it's uncontrollable gasping, hyperventilation, uh, panic, a change in your heart rate and rhythm, a uh, change in your blood pressure. So all of this stuff happens right away as soon as you fall into cold water. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to wear a life jacket all the time. Because if you fall into cold water and you start gasping and hyperventilating and you're having a hard time holding your head out of the water, you're going to inhale water. This is probably, or it is, our, our most dangerous phase where we lose the most boaters um, is in this initial reaction or this cold shock response. And so research is showing us one of the best things to do is actually just to float first. Um, and there's, you know, a few reasons for that. One of them is just physically, um, because of everything that's happening to your body, research shows us that if you try to override everything that's happening to your body, you're actually going to, um, use so much energy that you're going to cut back on your survival time, you know, sort of on the back end, you won't be able to survive for as long in the cold water if you find yourself in there for a while. Uh, the other reason is just what happens to us mentally. So, you know, there are lots of stories that I hear. Um, one of them, one of my favorites was told to me by a teacher in the Anchorage School District. Um, she said her and her husband were doing a, a polar plunge in Anchorage um, where they cut a big block of, of ice out of the lake and they jump in. And she's a stronger swimmer. So she jumped in. She said it was the, the most painfully cold thing she's ever experienced in her life. Um, she beat him to the other side. She climbed up in front of him um, on the ladder and he reached up, pulled her off the ladder and climbed up in front of her. And she wasn't super happy about that. So they were having a conversation about it and they ended up tracking down this film crew because she was convinced that he did do this. He was convinced that he didn't, he wouldn't do that. Um, but when they tracked down this film crew that actually, you know, videos this for the local news, he did actually reach up, pull her off the ladder and climb up in front of her. And she did say that's very uncharacteristic of him. So not only did he do something that he wouldn't normally do, but he doesn't even remember doing it. And part of that comes back to um, what we're experiencing here. I was kayaking on uh, Jewel Lake in Anchorage and Jewel Lake is a, a long, narrow lake. And so when the wind gets blowing in the right direction, you do actually get some, some pretty good waves and even some white caps on that lake. And that's what was happening on this day in particular. So I was out there kayaking, but I was kind of staying on the edge. Um, and there was a young girl in a kayak that was really kind of wobbly and a little bit small for her. And she started going out towards the middle of the lake um, and just didn't know how to turn. 
especially with the waves and the wind. And she kind of knew that if she tried to turn, she was going to capsize. Everyone kind of knew it that was watching. And so she just kept going straight, which was bringing her right into the middle of the lake. And eventually the wind and the waves, she just capsized and she actually got kind of stuck inside her boat. And so I got out to her and helped to pull her out of her boat. And thankfully I've done this enough that I knew to kind of keep her boat between me and her. But I was really worried about getting blown away from her because it was so windy. And so I was asking her to grab onto her kayak and she was um, telling me she couldn't, but the whole time she was trying to reach over her boat and grab onto my boat and grab onto me. Um, and she just kept saying, my arms aren't working, but they seem to be working pretty fine to me. I was trying to offer her my paddle to hold onto. I just really didn't want her grabbing onto me um, because of the panic state that she was in. And I was asking her to grab onto my paddle and it was the same thing. I can't, my arms aren't working, but the whole time she's reaching up and kind of clawing at me. Um, and it was maybe about 45 seconds and then her whole demeanor changed, her face changed, her attitude changed, she was calm, we could have a conversation. Um, I could tell her um, what to do, she could follow my instructions. And all it was was this cold shock response sort of going away. So it really doesn't take that long. But when I was talking to that girl after that, um, she kept saying, you know, she swims in this lake all the time. She was a young girl, maybe about 12, 12 or 13. And so when she started experiencing this cold shock response and feeling like she didn't have control over her body and not knowing why that was because she swims in this water all the time, she, um, it made her more scared and it sort of re-emphasized this panic. Um, and so she wasn't making very good decisions in those, you know, 45 seconds or a minute. Um, and so for me as a rescuer waiting, because she did have on a life jacket, we were at Jewel Lake, there were lots of people around the shore. I felt pretty comfortable, you know, waiting for that minute to try to put her back in her boat. And had I not done that, she probably would have flipped me over too. And then we both would have been in the water. So just understanding that um, not only is a lot happening to us physically in these few minutes, but that we're, we're not likely to make good decisions. And so just float first, wait for the, ex the effects of this cold shock response to pass. Um, and then you can start self-rescuing or coming up with a plan um, to get back into the boat or to get to shore or to get rescue coming to you. Um, but this really, this float first, it you know really works best if you have on a life jacket. So cold incapacitation. So this happens, you know, it says within the first 30 minutes, but it's usually about 10 to 30 minutes in most of the water that we have in Alaska. So what happens, um, a lot of people tend to mistake this with hypothermia, but it's, it's not hypothermia. In fact, it's actually your body trying to prevent hypothermia from happening. Hypothermia is your core body temperature dropping. And what's happening here um, is your body starts to realize it's going to be in cold water for a little while. And so it's trying to protect your vital organs and keep them as warm as possible for as long as possible. So this process of vasoconstriction starts to happen where your blood vessels and your arms and your legs start to constrict. Um, and so less blood is gonna go to your extremities where it's gonna lose heat faster and more blood's gonna stay in your core where your body can keep it warmer longer. So this is really from a big picture long-term situation, this is a good thing that your body's doing this because it is going to take all of those um, uh, important organs and prioritize them. And the downside is, you know, what are the effects of poor circulation? Um, we lose dexterity in our fingers. Um, we lose function in our arms and our legs. We can experience sudden cramping. Um, and so again, if you don't have on a light jacket, it's gonna be very difficult to swim after about 10 minutes. Um, the other thing that's important for us to realize with this is that we have um, you know, a relatively small amount of time to get done some really important things. And so if we're gonna try to get back into our boat, we need to do that right away. Um, if we're gonna try to swim to shore, we wanna start swimming right away. Um, if we're going to call for help, we want to use those devices right away because even something as simple as um, using an inReach device or, um, 
you know, using a radio is going to be hard when we can't feel our fingers. You know, uh, when I work with kids, I'll ask them, has anyone ever had their, their hand go to fall asleep on them? If you slept on it funny or had your feet fall asleep, if you sat on your feet funny and everyone's experienced that. And if you think back to that time and trying to function and use small buttons and fine motor skills, um, you know, that's going to be very difficult to do. So doing those things right away. Also, um, the benefit to that is um, if you're, you know, it's better to get help coming right away or to notify people, even if you think you can get back into the boat, even if you think you can handle the situation yourself, if you can reach out to someone and just let them know what's going on. Um, then if for some reason you can't get back into the boat or the situation uh, is a little more dire than you originally thought it was, um, you're able to, um, you know, contact those people. They're kind of ready to go and they can get to you a lot faster. So then our last stage, um, this is immersion hypothermia. A lot of people think that this is our biggest risk as boaters out on the water. And the reality is it's just not. When we look at our fatality statistics, we have sudden onset emergencies, things happening quickly, people who don't have on a life jacket in the first place, who then don't have time to put on a life jacket um, because they end up overboard so fast. Um, and then they either drown in that initial cold shock response um, or they're unable to swim after this cold in incapacitation starts. Immersion hypothermia takes at least 30 minutes, and we have a lot of research that shows us that, um, even in really cold water, um, because of what your body's doing and prioritizing those vital organs, um, you have a lot more time than most people think that you have when you're in cold water. Um, and even once your body temperature starts to drop, you still have a while of useful consciousness, usually at least an hour, um, which is a lot of time um, if you have on a life jacket, if you have a way to call for help um, to get help coming to you, um, you've set yourself up really well to be able to survive a boat accident. Um, and so again, just certain things, um, you know, if you you know, I keep snacks in my, my life jacket, partly because I just, you know, if I'm going to be out on the boat, I would like to have snacks. But um, if I can eat, if I end up in the water, that's actually a good thing. Um, and keeping those layers on, um, staying positive, there's a lot of common ground there with boat accident survivors that who have been in the water for a very long time. So they stayed really positive. They stayed focused on getting to shore. They were determined to get there. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that seems to be really important is that positive outlook, that survival mentality. So I've talked a lot about life jackets. So I'm going to uh, talk to you guys about some options that are out there. So there's a lot of, um, you know, new technology that's gone into life jackets. The law in Alaska is that children under the age of 13 are required to wear a life jacket in an open boat or on the deck of a boat. So any open boat, that includes stand-up paddle boards, canoes, kayaks, those are all open boats and kids do have to wear a life jacket. Everyone else is required to have at least one life jacket on the boat that's U.S. Coast Guard approved in serviceable condition. We'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, and it has to be readily accessible. But again, with all the stuff that we, we know about the boat accidents that we see, and we know about the boating fatalities, uh, it just works better if you have them on your body. So um, just wearing them, finding one that's comfortable for you to wear for the activity that you're doing is huge. Um, so I wanna start off, uh, talk about just sort of one of the more basic ones. So this life jacket is designed specifically for um, hunting and fishing. And so you can see it has a ton of pockets on it. So it's actually really convenient to wear because you can put um, all of your stuff in there and have it right at hand. Not only that, but um, it's designed to sit really low on your body. So it's not up around your shoulders at all. So again, going back to um, those those activities and the things we need to use our arms for. If you're trying to shoulder a gun, if you're hunting from a boat, um, or if you're casting from a boat, this isn't going to be in your way. It's going to be low on your body and your arms are going to be free to move. And you're going to be able to do those activities with your life jacket on. Um, so that's an option um, if you like to do that sort of thing. 
Um, this is another one that's uh, similar, but a, a little bit lower profile. Um, this one's designed specifically for kayaking, canoeing, kind of paddling. Um, but see if you can see it this way, but this leg jacket, it kind of has a lot of flotation material in the front and on the back, it's really high up. And that way you can sit in the seat and it's not uncomfortable. This will kind of be over the top of the seat. Um, again, it's got pockets so you can keep things like, you know, a whistle, um, emergency communication signaling devices in there. That's really important to think about. Because if you get separated from your boat and your radios on your boat, or if your in reach devices on your boat, um, then you're not going to be able to use that. And so having a way to kind of keep that stuff on your person is really important. And so um, life jackets with pockets are great. Um, this one has lots of options for storing things. Um, it's really comfortable to use. And the other really nice thing about these paddling life jackets is they tend to have a lot of adjustment points. And so your life jacket fit is really important for the life jacket performance if you end up in the water. If your life jacket is too big, it's gonna ride up on you. It's not gonna be comfortable and it's gonna be really hard for you to do the things that you need to do to keep yourself safe. And so if you can find one with a lot of different adjustment points, so this one has, um, seven different adjustment points on it. So you're able to get a really custom fit so your life jacket doesn't move around on you. Um, so I'm not sure how much, you know, uh, tubing or toad sports or water skiing that happens in your area. But if you're doing those types of activities, it is important to have a life jacket that's designed for those types of activities. So where the paddle jacket and sort of the hunting jacket, they're sort of designed to really not cover certain parts of your body so that you're free to move. Life jackets that are designed for, um, we call them uh, impact rated life jackets for those sports where um, you're likely to hit the water at a high speed. Um, they're sort of the opposite. They're actually designed to kind of cover your whole torso, go from your shoulders to your hips. If you think about all the important stuff in there. It's, they wrap all the way around your body. Um, so they're designed not only to help you float, but to absorb some of that impact if you do take a high speed fall. Um, and where you would find that information is on the life jacket label. So on the inside, this is sort of a, an older label. Um, I'll show you guys a newer one. Um, they've sort of recently changed. So you'll see both um, on life jackets if you're looking for them. But when you're looking on the label, you're looking for three things specifically. You wanna make sure it's US Coast Guard approved because that is part of the law. Everyone has to have a US Coast Guard approved life jacket. Um, you're looking for the size to see if it'll fit. This one's a small. And you're looking for um, the intended use. So this one says it's a ski vest or wave boarding, a wakeboarding vest or personal watercraft. So again, those, you know, really fast um, toad sports. And for kids who are doing that, the same life jacket law applies. So children under the age of 13 are required to wear a life jacket when they're doing those. But it's really just a good idea for everybody. So those are pretty standard life jackets, and those are life jackets that people um, usually know a lot about, but I do think that they've improved um, and they continue to improve as far as being comfortable um, and, you know, fitting better, getting more of a custom fit. You'll see less and less life jackets that are sort of that universal fit um, because that universal fit really isn't universal at all. <laughs> There's a lot of body types that, that just really doesn't fit well. So, um having lots of options out there with specific sizes um, that are have lots of different adjustment points that are comfortable, um, figuring out where to put that flotation material to keep you safe, but also to keep you free to do the activities that you're trying to do out on the water. There are also some other options I want to show you guys. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen these as well. These float coats are really nice. Um, especially if you're boating in colder weather. Um, this one's really thick. It's actually really warm. Um, it's designed to keep you warm even if you go in the water. And so when you're boating in cold weather, it is a little um, sort of discouraging or you know, you're not excited to add another layer of bulk um, over all of the layers that you already have on. So if you can take that outer layer that um, 
that winter jacket and just turn it into something that floats. Um, that just kind of helps keep you more comfortable as well. And this is also a great option um, for people who are snow machining out on water, especially in early and late season, um, you know, when those machines are a little more prone to going through the ice, um, wearing something that'll float um, is a really good idea. Just something to be aware of on these though. Um, just make sure um, you're reading the label, you're wearing it in accordance with the label. So some of these will say that they're only US Coast Guard approved when worn. So if you don't have them on, if you just have them readily accessible, that doesn't count as a life jacket. So just make sure that you're, you're reading the label. But again, they, they work a lot better when you wear it anyway. So having them on is a good thing. This is a, um, a newer life jacket that's kind of out there. It's what they call a hybrid life jacket. So there is some inherent buoyancy in here. It does float sort of on its own as is, um, which is really nice if you fall into the water. Um, it will keep your head above water. And if you realize you're going to be in the water for a little while, you can always pull this tab um, and it will inflate and it'll give you extra buoyancy. And so that's a really good option. And it'll also kind of keep you floating on your back, which is really nice because only this front part inflates. And so this is a nice option where it's really low profile. There's really not a lot of bulk, um, but it does help keep you safe while you're out there. It gives you that inherent buoyancy. Um, if you should fall overboard or something unexpected should happen. And then you also kind of have this backup and this reserve if you realize you're gonna be out there for a while and you want a little extra flotation. And then I also just want to show you, this is kind of one of those newer labels. So this is kind of what you're gonna see. When you buy a life jacket, it typically has a book attached to it, a little pamphlet that explains what all of that information on the label means to you. So I really recommend that you, you check that out and you use that so that way you can make sure that you're using your life jacket in the best way possible. I also want to talk about just some other inflatable life jackets. Some options that are out there. Oh, it looks like I brought two the same. Um, there are some that inflate um, automatically. Some of them have a little dissolvable tablet in them. Um, and when that tablet dissolves, it really only takes a couple seconds. You don't have to be completely submerged, um, but that life jacket will inflate automatically. And so that's a really nice option um, because again, oftentimes there's a reason we went overboard. Um, it could be rough weather. Um, it could be a sign capsize. Uh, it could be an ejection. Those things happen really fast. And if you're experiencing that cold shock response, um, in addition to maybe just some disorientation from whatever caused you to go into the water, um, you may not be sort of with it enough to kind of pull that, pull on that string and inflate the life jacket. So having an option that inflates automatically is really nice. There are a couple different options. There's that one with that dissolvable tablet. And the nice thing about that is you don't have to be sort of completely submerged in the water um, and it'll inflate on its own. Um, but uh, the downside to that option is if you um, are working in an environment where you're getting splashed all the time, that tablet's gonna start slowly dissolving over time. Um, and then all of a sudden you're going to randomly sort of have this, you know, uh, life raft around your neck. Um, and that's not, you know, ideal for anyone. There's also these hydrostatic ones um, where you do have to actually be completely submerged. Um, but it does, again, only take a few seconds um, and it'll inflate automatically. Or you can just pull the tab and inflate it if it won't inflate automatically. So these are really nice options. They're really low profile. They don't get in your way, um, but they don't float as is. Um, and there is some extra care that you have to take with them. Um, so you want to um, make sure there's sort of a little indicator on here. I'll see if you guys can see that, but it's green right now. Um, so if that little circle was red, it would mean that this life jacket is not gonna inflate. There's something wrong with it. Um, maybe that cartridge isn't good anymore. And there's something wrong with the, the um, system for automatic inflation, um, but it's gonna let you know. So it's important to check that. Um, it's important to 
um, replace that cartridge when the manufacturer recommends, sometimes it's one year, sometimes it's three years, um, but figure out what that specific manufacturer recommends for that life jacket um, and make sure it's gonna be in good working order for when you need it. Because if it's not in good working order, if there's something wrong with the cartridge, this isn't gonna inflate the way that it is right now. So that's why, you know, the hybrid's kind of a nice option too, because you do have a little bit of that inherent buoyancy in there. Um, so making sure that you have your life jacket on, it's in serviceable condition, it's ready to go. I'm gonna try to jump back to this PowerPoint here. So again, this is our law. Anyone under the age of 13 is required to have a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket in an open boat or on deck. Um, and everyone has to have one that's readily accessible that fits them. So if you just have a bunch of kid life jackets in your boat, um, obviously that's not going to do you any good um, if you do end up needing one. Um, so it's just not smart, but it's also um, not legal. Um, and here we see in this picture, this is really great. We have dad with his life jacket on, even though he doesn't have to, he's saying a great example for his kids who are in the boat. Um, so in addition to a life jacket, you also have to have um, a a throwable device if your boat is 16 feet or longer, um, with the exception of canoes and kayaks. So if you have a canoe or kayak, you are exempt from that, but any other boat that's 16 feet or longer should have a, a throwable device on it. And again, while this is a lot, it's also just a really good idea um, to carry in case you need to get something that floats to someone really quickly. Um, and you can also carry more than that. This is kind of the minimum standard. So I personally can throw a throw bag of rope a lot further than I can throw a personal flotation device. Um, and so that's my preference, but if that bag of rope isn't gonna float. So if someone's in the water and they don't have on a life jacket, then that's probably the best option. So we talked about um, life jackets being Coast Guard approved. We talk about wearing them in accordance with the label. Um, but they also have to be in serviceable condition. And so that means you don't want any rips or tears in your life jacket, um, especially where that flotation material could come out because then you know, you've just got on a vest with holes in it um, and it's not gonna help you float at all. Um, where where that flotation material can be damaged. So um, if it's exposed and little pieces of it are falling out as you're, you're wearing it, um, that's not good either. You're, it's not going to perform in the same way. You want to make sure that the zippers work, all of the buckles work. So even if it has three or four buckles, they should all be working um, because if you can't do all of them, the life jacket is just not going to be able to float you the way that it was designed to. Um, and then you also just want to inspect that material. So that flotation material should be spongy when you squish it. And if it's really stiff and rigid, um, it probably means that it's losing a lot of its buoyancy. Um, and so that's not really good either. That life jacket should be replaced because it's not going to float you like it was intended to. And then lastly, they can become waterlogged. And so water can get into that flotation material um, over time and just kind of sit in there and then um, it's not going to float at all. So um, not, not a good uh, situation there. So some things that you can do for life jacket care um, store them clean. So we wear them, you know, down around the mud, they get dirty. That's fine. They can be dirty for a short period of time, but if you leave them dirty, it is going to wear on that float on that, uh, material and it's more likely a tear. So if you clean them off after you use them, um, hang them up to dry. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of them is you do want to make sure that they're not sitting in a puddle of water because that is when they'll get waterlogged. Um, so they'll dry better um, and then you're less likely to set something heavy on top of it than if it's flat. If it's being stored under something heavy or if you're constantly sitting on it on the boat, um, you are compressing that flotation material and that's when it kind of gets stiff and rigid and it loses some of its um, you know, flotation characteristics. So this is, uh, this graphic isn't displaying very well here, but um, you can look this up on alaskaboatingsafety.org. If you go under our publications tab, which is at the, the top of the screen there, you'll see um, lots of resources that we have for you. One of them is uh, this graphic that sort of breaks down 
really easy to understand what do you need to have on your boat, but also understand that this is the, the minimum. You should also have safety equipment that goes beyond this um, so that you and your passengers can be safe while you're out boating. So this is some of that stuff that's not required, but is a good idea. Um, VHF radios, especially if they're used um, frequently in the area that you are, um, they're a great tool because you can contact multiple people at the same time um, if you're using a, a heavy use channel. Um, the downside to radios um, is they are limited in how far that they'll reach. So if you're outside of that range, they're not gonna work very well. Or if you're in an area um, where, you know, maybe that community doesn't use radios um, or you don't know what channel the community listens to, then they're not as useful. But having some type of satellite messaging device, um, in reaches are great. You can actually text on them. You can check the weather. You can do all sorts of things on them. They are a little bit more expensive. Um, you do have to have kind of that monthly plan. Um, but uh, if you're going to be using them a lot, that might be worth it. Um, and there are some nice benefits to that where, you know, if you just run out of gas, you can text someone to help bring you out some gas. Um, or if you're just running late, you can text someone and let them know that you're running late and you're, you're safe where you're at. Um, you're just not going to be back quite, quite when you expect it to be. Um, personal locator beacons are also a, a really nice option. Um, it is nice to be able to contact people locally, um, but sometimes in an emergency when you need serious help quickly, um, it's nice to be able to, to get that. And so a personal locator beacon, um, they're, they're small, they can fit in your pocket. Um, you know, the battery's good for five years. There's no monthly charge. You do have to register them to, to yourself. Um, but this is basically a little bit about how it works. Um, you can't text on it. There's only one button, but um, it is sort of an uh, emergency button um, that when you push that button, that signal goes to the satellite and it drops directly to the local user terminal, which in Alaska are military bases. Um, and that goes directly to the mission control center and they launch a helicopter. So they have your GPS coordinates and they go. It happens very fast. Um, and they're... Uh, the satellites are a little bit more evenly spread than a lot of the private networks, so you're more likely to make that connection in an emergency. Um, and then not only do they have your original GPS coordinates, but this personal locator beacon will keep sending out a signal that they can eventually pick up on the radar in the helicopter, which will bring them directly into you. So it's a good way to get help quickly, um, and it's an accurate way for them to be able to find you. So that's a um, one option to look into. Again, it really it's uh, depends on where you're boating, um, what what device is going to work best for you. But you should carry a communication and signaling device, and it should be on your person. So that way, if you're separated from your boat, you have that with you, and you can actually use it. So I'm going to skip through a couple here, but talking, uh, this isn't, prop strikes aren't a huge issue in Alaska, thankfully, um, in places where it's warmer and you do have a lot more swimmers where people are boating, it's a little bit more common, um, but you can avoid them uh, with an engine cutoff switch. The other benefit to that is if you're separated from your boat um, with, through either a capsize or um, an ejection, if you hit a, you know, hit a sandbar and you get thrown from the boat and the boat keeps going, you're not going to be able to reboard that. Or if you hit a submerged log and you get thrown from the boat, the boat keeps going, you're not going to be able to reboard that boat. So with an engine cutoff switch, you'll turn that engine off. It keeps the boat right there. Um, so not only are you safer because uh, that motor is not going to be going right next to you, um, but you can also get back onto that boat. You can override that that switch once it's turned off and you can keep going. So it's a much better situation than um, either being in, in the water with a runaway boat or um, getting back to shore, but having, you know, who knows how far you are between communities. And so uh, having an engine cutoff device and using it, actually attaching it to you can go a really long way um, in keeping yourself safe while you're out on the water. Um, so this is just something I'd like to um, touch on. I think it's important, but uh, with our uh, uh, boating fatalities in Alaska, um, and in the last 30 years from 
1990 to 2020, we've had 580 boating fatalities, which is a lot of people. And we know that 37% of those alcohol was a factor. And that's a lot of people. Um, and we know that in about 30% of them, alcohol was not a factor. So this number could actually be a bit higher. We just don't know um, for various reasons. Um, so it's not a good idea. We have the same laws in Alaska, the same laws that apply to drinking and driving, apply to boating and driving. Um, so if you if you are operating a vessel and you have a 0.08 uh, blood alcohol content or a behavior that meets a certain standard, you are legally operating impaired um, and you will get points against your driver's license. Um, and that applies to all boats. So um, canoes, kayaks, stand up paddle boards, you should not be drinking while you're out there. And not just because it's illegal, but also just because it's a really bad idea, knowing that um, it greatly increases your chances of being in a boating accident and also not surviving that boating accident. So um, it's a topic a lot of people don't like to talk about, but um, I think it should be talked about more because it does have such a, um, you know, when we look at those fatality statistics, you know, over 200 people may still be here um, had they not been drinking and boating. So um, keep that in mind with this holiday weekend coming up. Um, you know, if you're going to boat, just save it for the shore um, when you get get back. Um, Pledgelive.org. It's actually pledge to live ak.org now. We recently changed the domain. Um, it's a really great resource for you guys. Um, you can check weather, tides, there's links to the FAA cams. So you can look in different communities along the river and see what the weather is actually doing there. Um, so lots of information that you can use there. And also make sure that you're filing a float plan. So someone knows where you're going, when you expect to be there, who to contact if you're if you're overdue. Um, so if they don't hear from you um, by a certain time, they know to start looking for you. Um, that's a, a really important safety feature. There are online ones you can use, um, or you can just text someone. And it can be as simple as, you know, I'm leaving from this point at this time. I expect to be there by this time. If you don't hear from me, by this time, then send help. Um, and so people know where to start looking for you. And you do have to file a boat accident report if there was an injury that required more than basic first aid. So if you called in outside assistance or if anyone went to a clinic or a hospital, um, we do need to know about that. If there's more than $500 worth of damage to the vessel, um, or if there's a missing person or a fatality, obviously we do want to hear about that. Um, and you're not going to get in trouble for reporting these things. If someone, you know, got hurt while you were boating, we're not going to fine you. Um, there's going to be no punishment for that. It just sort of helps us keep track of what types of accidents are happening and how do we help prevent that from happening in the future. So no um, punishment for you. It's not for enforcement purposes. It's for education, to improve education and help people be safer while they're out in the water. So just in conclusion, some of the things I hope you do coming up, um, wear a life jacket anytime you're out on a boat, especially in an open boat or on the deck of a boat. Uh, carry a communication signaling device on your person that's going to work in the area where you're boating. Uh, carry a reboarding device. I didn't really touch on that one, um, but you could see them practicing at the pool session, a way to get back into your boat and practice and wear an engine cutoff device. So that way you can reboard your boat. Your boat doesn't take off without you um, and you can continue on your journey. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions or if you'd like to um, talk more about classes that we have that we can offer, or if you have questions about the Kids Don't Float Life Jacket Learner Board stations, um, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions for you. Um, and then this is uh, Joe McCullough, our boating law administrator. So if you have any questions, he's also able to answer those for you. So uh, Tierra, do we have any questions uh, so far today? So I don't see any questions right now, but if anybody comes up with any, I can put this contact information in the video on Facebook. Perfect, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. That was a lot of good information. I hope everybody takes that home with them, um, especially for the upcoming holiday this weekend.
Um, yeah, so I hope everybody stays safe and thank you again, Annie. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye everyone.